My name is Lakrantan. And your computer screen is just about to explode. In 2018, Japanese filmmaker Hirokazu Koreeda's Shoplifters was released, being met with universal acclaim, winning the Palme d'Or at Cannes and nominated for Best Foreign Language Film at the Academy Awards. Along with Lee Chang Dong's Burning, Shoplifters started popping up in many best of the year lists from prominent film critics and YouTubers alike, carving an area for Asian cinema in Western film discussion. For many, this was an introduction to Koreeda and his intimate portrayals of family and kinship, and possibly even an introduction to Japanese film apart from Studio Ghibli. Following Shoplifters, Bong Joon-ho's Parasite set the world on fire, gaining an unbelievable amount of traction from winning award after award, culminating in it winning Best Picture at the Oscars. With the success of these films, many new cinephiles have begun to explore the vast array of films that Asia has to offer. Of these, I want to discuss another of Koreeda's films. His first feature-length film and my personal favourite, Mabaroshi no Hikari, or simply Mabaroshi. Based on the novel of the same name by Teru Miyamoto, the film follows Yumiko, a young woman living in Osaka, mother to a newborn Yuichi, and the aftermath of her husband's supposedly unmotivated suicide. After a few years, she remarries to a widower in a small town on the coast of the Sea of Japan. From here, we explore themes of grief, death, and as typical of Koreeda, family. Slow and meditative in comparison to his later work, Mabarossi reflects the work of the old Japanese masters of film, specifically Ozu. Many of the aspects in this film that I'm about to talk about are ex covered more extensively in Keiko McDonald's essay on the film in her book, Reading a Japanese Film. This analysis really made me appreciate said elements, and I would recommend checking that out after this if you wanted to know more. Mabaroshi no Hikari can be literally translated as phantasmic or phantasmal light closely mirroring the largely European concept of the Will of the Wisp, a spectral light known to mislead and trick travellers, and we see this concept littered all throughout the film. From the opening scene, Yumiko's grandmother runs away from the family home to go die in her hometown. She is drawn by the allure of death, the phantom light. It is, however, understandable that an old woman who can feel that she is close to the end of her life has come to terms with her mortality and thus decided to die. This first trick of the light does not strike us as strange or out of place. Instead, as the young child in Yumiko tries to take her home, we don't see the grandmother's actions as irrational, but rather the child not fully grasping the gravity of death. The second appearance of the phantom light comes at a much more pivotal time in both the story and the life of Yumiko, as Ikuo, her husband, doesn't come home from work one day. Walking along the train tracks, unfazed by the sound of an approaching train and the honking of a horn, Ikuo is described by the train engineer as never looking back. We see this magnetic pull of the phantom light in the events leading up to Ikuo's death. As he comes back home from work to get an umbrella, Yumiko follows him around, infatuated and jubilant or why Ikuo walks away, back to work, never looking back. There is no explicit indication of Ikuo's imminent death, however, on a repeat watch, it is in his demeanour that we see the spectre approach, one that will irreversibly turn Yumiko's life upside down. Following Ikuo's death, Yumiko is left alone to look after her newborn. She is now much more reserved without her husband, silent and hardly moving as the baby is being cleaned. The joy has been seemingly sucked out of her. Even after a few years have passed, she is still obviously grief-stricken. Loss, seemingly meaningless, has completely changed her demeanour, possibly forever. But with a young child, moving on is a necessity, as painful as it may be. So, she agrees to an arranged marriage with a widower. Tamiyo, who lives with his daughter and father in a village on the coast of the Sea of Japan. Yumiko's arrival at her new seaside home is formal and respectful, a far cry from her previous carefree nature. We see her settle into her new life as she tries to adapt and move on. We don't get much dialogue, just snippets of this new family slowly coming together. Extended shots of the scenery along the coast, the new house and the family doing everyday things gives us a chance to meditate on Yumiko's thoughts. She seems to be happier, she smiles more as the time passes at a new home. On a hot day, she relaxes with Tamiyo, and we see the Yumiko of old return, if only for a brief moment. 
On a train ride back to Osaka for her brother's wedding, she watches the children with a smile. She seems to have moved on, to have accepted Ikuo's death and embraced her new life with open arms. As she travels around Osaka, visiting the people she had left behind, she begins to reflect on her old life. She walks with her head down, and it culminates in her visiting the coffee shop that she frequented while living in Osaka. The attendant, an old friend, reveals that Ikuo came into the shop just before his death. We may be expected to be supplied with some reason, as if there was a missing piece to make sense of Ikuo's death, but instead, he reinforces what we already saw, a seemingly normal man, on his way home, who is drawn to death for no discernible reason. There is no reason, there is no closure. Yumiko is left with more questions, plagued by loss, even having trouble sleeping. As the family waits for Tomino, the old fisherwoman and friend, to return on the night of a large storm, Yumiko is faced with a third appearance of the Phantom Light. It seems almost inevitable that Tomino is to die, a frail old woman in the brutal hands of the stormy sea. But she returns, and Tomio tells her not to worry, that she is indestructible. But again, Yumiko is faced with the possibility of loss, with the pain that she has faced ever since her grandma left to die. Immediately after, Yumiko visits Tomino, who asks her how old Yuichi was when Ikuo died. This leads to the next scene, in which Yumiko takes out a bike key, the only physical remnant of Ikuo she has. Tamiyo comes home drunk, and in a fit of melancholic fervor, Yumiko begins questioning him on his first wife. In asking Tamiyo how he could move on from the death of his childhood sweetheart, it seems that Yumiko is projecting her own shame and regrets over remarrying. Tamiyo avoids the question, telling her to save it for tomorrow, ultimately leaving the problem unresolved. Yumiko runs away and follows a funeral procession, whose chimes closely mimic the jingle of Ikuo's bicycle keys. The procession is always shot from far away, the faces of the mourners indiscernible, clad in black. They look like shadows marching along the seaside. Following behind, Yumiko reflects on death and stares down the meaningless of it all. The much-beloved final long take of the procession typifies the incredible contemplative power of this film, as we see Yumiko lingering some distance from the mourners, the dark grey sky bearing menacingly above, as if the small silhouettes are bearing its entire weight on its shoulders. Thus, as the procession moves off the left side of the screen, Yumiko is left in the centre, walking solemnly across the bleak landscape, all while the haunting jingle of the funeral chime rings through the music. We arrive at the edge of the sea, with Yumiko staring at a lit funeral pyre at the end of a jetty. It is the final arrival of the Phantom Light, the allure of death, as we stare at the sea, where Tomino escaped, now looking to draw Yumiko into its grasp. Tamio, having found her, walks up to the jetty and stands some distance away. Yumiko stands between the pyre and her husband, between life and death. She turns around to face Tamio and walks towards him, towards life. The camera pans to the right and the pyre disappears out of frame. The silence between the couple as they walk off the jetty is broken by a devastated Yumiko, as she cries out to Tamiya that she doesn't understand why Ikuo killed himself. The thought of death consumes her as soon as she is reminded of it. The lack of meaning eludes her, as it does for all of us. She desperately asks Tamiya why he think Ikuo died. Tamiya's answer gives us an explicit mention of the titular phantom light. He tells Yumiko of his father's stories of a mesmerizing light out at sea, and how it called him in, that it could happen to anyone. They walk off the jetty, away from the pyre, away from the sea. After such a bleak and melancholic scene, the final sequence is one of hope and acceptance. Yumiko, now dressed in white, a far cry from the usual dark colors she wears, stares out onto a new family, playing in the driveway with her father-in-law, idly commenting on the weather. The proclamation that it is going to be a wonderful season is one that likely reflects Yumiko's future, one no longer plagued by immense grief. We see a slight smile on Yumiko's face perhaps, one that may signify her having faced death and come to terms with its inevitability and vacuity. Mabaroshi is a film that addresses the universal experience of death in a quiet and reserved manner with even the largest emotional outbursts being suppressed behind bowed heads and clasped hands. It makes us reflect on our own experiences with death and grief, to think about the inherent meaninglessness of loss. 
we look through the eyes of Yumiko and find the times the phantom light has called us in our lives, to find the leer of death and wonder how it will appear next time, or how we will handle it when it claims a loved one. Death is scary, but Quareta reminds us that it should not be all-consuming, that searching for the reason behind death is a path for the phantom light, Mabarashi no Hikari, to find its way to us.